<clears throat> yes, hello everyone. My name is Annie O, and indeed it is a very special honor to be back in the sacred halls of the WHU, because I did spend many years here, and I graduated in 2006 and went to London to be an investment banker. And today I'm a professional DJ. What the hell happened? <laughs> so just to give you an example of <laughs> the difference. <laughs> So, I would like to take you through my last 10 years of the journey and um, more importantly, I want to talk about the factors actually that led to such a crucial change in not only career but obviously in lifestyle. Because many people, when they hear about the top line of the story from banker to DJ, they, they immediately say, oh my God, that's so courageous of you. You, know, you. you left the corporate world and do your own thing and follow your dreams. But to be honest, that's only part of the story. And actually, it's not the story at all, because I don't think it was courage at all, because I want to show that it was a lot more subtle factors at work, and it was more like, let's call it, a correction on my path towards self-realization. But I'm going to talk more about that. So let's, um, let's begin. So I want to basically walk you through my journey. So I brought a few things. So I want to put this as my, uh, that's my DJ cornerstone. And this is my investment banking cornerstone <laughs> with a few coins. <laughs> and actually, I want to sail you through my journey and not walk through my journey because, as you might have seen, I like the idea, the whole framework of my talk is the inner compass. So I believe that somehow we have something within us that will lead us towards fulfilling our potential. But what do I mean by potential? Um, well, it's a bit of an abstract concept, but I believe it's a mixture of our capabilities and skills, our interests and our needs. And there's a line in psychology that suggests that an individual um, will always follow a path towards fulfilling their potential if the circumstances are supportive. But, however, if there's any factors hindering them from doing so, it can lead to inner conflict. So I want to uh, take this as an idea for my, my story. Okay, right, let's start. So here I am, I want to start here. Here I am at the end of school. So I was 18 years old and I knew I wanted to study business because I was quite analytically minded. I liked structure and efficiency and I wanted to um, apply that in real life situations. So also, I had always been quite good at school, and in my youth, I played three different types of sports, all single sports, no team sports, <laughs> and um, in all of them I ran in competitions. So very early on, I had internalized a liking for competitiveness, for performance, and a belief that I could gain validation through achievement. So no wonder then, when I heard about this university, I was like, all right then. <laughs> so I applied only to this university and then, you know, did that mission test, got accepted and started studying. So there I was on the way. <laughs> um, and naturally this kind of highly achievement and performance driven environment kept on feeding into, into that focus on achievement. In hindsight, I realized that I've been motivated by, you know, my own projected image of a competent and successful businesswoman. So that was what I was following. So I uh, specialized in finance, and then a year before graduation, I went to London to do an internship with Merrill Lynch, and I pretty much enjoyed it. Well, in hindsight, I'm not quite sure whether it was the, uh, the job or London that I enjoyed more. But anyway, when they made me a job offer for the year after, I happily accepted. So. I went back to uni for my last year and I danced my way through school because I was like, yeah, I landed a great job and I was proud and happy and elated and, you know, did the bare minimum to get my degree and um, <laughs> I'm sure Professor Rudolph, who I actually wrote my final thesis with, I think he can uh, attest that how terrible my final thesis was. But anyway, so there I was. I handed in my thesis the day after I flew to New York for investment banking training and, you know, I had the time of my life and then I moved to London to start working. So, so far so good. I had achieved the first cornerstone of being that competent and successful businesswoman. I had achieved 
validation through achievement. I was 22 years old. I worked for one of the most well-known investment banks at the time, at least. <laughs> and um, I earned my, my yearly starting salary was close to 100,000 euros. So I was proud. My parents were proud. So what the hell happened then? <laughs> so um, let me give you more context about London. So I moved to London and I moved into a six bedroom place with uh, you know, six other young people who were all not bankers. So they were all just normal young people doing some jobs and you know, doing, enjoying life in the meantime. And also a tiny, it seems like a tiny uh, factor, but actually I think it was pretty big, was that I had negotiated one month off with my team. So I didn't start working straight away, but I had one month off in London, fully paid, which was great. And so basically I immersed myself into, into London. And so I went out a lot, I, I, I watched lots of live bands, and I was really soaking up that life, that exciting life. And it felt like I was kind of, you know, catching up on everything that I, that I haven't had in my performance-focused student years. So then, when I then started working after a month, it was like I had kind of two personas. It felt like, you know, during the day I was the investment banker, and during all other times I was that you know, experience-seeking, fun-loving rock chick. And, but I was determined to be able to combine those two. It actually gave me a lot of strength to know I had two personas, and I was like, yeah, I'm going to do this. Well, <laughs> if you can, you know, as you can imagine, that didn't quite work out. So, uh, you know, working 12 hours a day alone actually takes a lot out of you. So, you know, I got more and more physically exhausted at first. So lack of sleep, exhaustion, and, you know, and I felt more and more suffocated. And during the day, so at work, I was getting more and more lethargic and unmotivated, and I couldn't wait till the day was over. So I could do all these other things that, you know, I, I wanted to be doing and to live that life that I had just about discovered for myself. So that inner conflict between my two personas grow, grew stronger and stronger, and I felt so suffocated. And also, my, my private persona started infiltrating my professional one. So I think I stretched the dress code at the bank as far as I could. <laughs> and in my breaks, I was smoking roll-up cigarettes. So I was kind of becoming this little rebel. <laughs> and um, after a while, I realized it, it just it got so bad, so this inner conflict. I knew I was wrong. I had to get out. And I knew it wasn't just a decision about the career, I knew it was a decision about how I wanted to live my life. So after six months of banking, <laughs> I quit. <laughs> so let me symbolize that by taking my jacket off. <laughs> so <laughs> this is my investment banking jacket. Right, so what happened then? I had no idea what to do next. I mean, I had no goal. I had no further goal. I had all these years, I had set my sails straight to here. And suddenly I was like, I don't know, I had no idea. But this is what, I think this is pretty crucial because metaphorically, I took my sails down and just started drifting on the waves of life. <laughs> and I think this is unconsciously, of course, this is when my inner compass actually started being able to work and to guide me. So this is, so the black compass was meant to be the one that was really, you know, the conscious decision to be an investment banker, and now the red compass is kind of guiding me into another direction. So what happened? Well, there's 10 years between here and there, so I've got to kind of um, summarize the important part. Um, basically, professionally, you could say it was a disaster. <laughs> so I was working in lots of freelance, part-time jobs. I was working in PR, advertising, marketing, admin. I, I was working in cafes, and at one point I worked at Topshop, <laughs> a clothing retail store on Oxford Circus for six pounds an hour. But it didn't matter, because on the other hand, on the private side of things, other things happened. So to start with, one turning point was pretty much still when I was a banker, but. I was, you know, I was at a live concert and as I, you know, I watched quite a lot of live gigs and then one night I realized that I was always watching the drummer in total fascination. And then I was like, I had a light bulb moment. I was like, I'm, I'm going to learn the drums. And so I did. I bought myself a drum kit and started, taught myself drumming. And it was so 
it was so easy. It was so like natural. I learned so quickly. My brain was soaking it up. It was literally like as if something came out that was already there. It was, it was really crazy. So I started drumming. <laughs> and at the exact same time, I met, again, fate, compass, whatever. I met a guy, a lovely guy at a pub, and um, he, he played in a band. And he was like, well, our drummer is about to quit. Do you not want to maybe step in? And I was like, I was, I was terrified, but I was like, hell yeah, am I going to step in? So after about three months of drumming, I think, I played my first gig in a band. <laughs> so great. <laughs> and um, I mean, that band didn't last very long, but this lovely guy and me, we founded our own band, and that was to become our baby for quite a few years. So that band was called Road Caption, <laughs> which is <laughs> German for Little Red Riding Hood. And uh, well, in London, no one could pronounce or even write our name on any bloody flyer. But um, anyway, so <laughs> we did live electronic music. So during that time, you know, we, we were so passionate about it. And I also discovered London clubs and electronic music. And we spent every single minute of our time to create new music, to learn the technology, the software, the, the equipment and everything. Went to lots of gigs. And it was just a really, really passionate, inspiring time. And so, you know, we played in that band for many years and it became a hobby. I mean, at first you play for free for like two years and then you get maybe 10 pounds and then, and then you build up from there. And then at some point we, we reached a point that was fairly professional and, well, I gave it my all. I said, this was, this was my focus. This is why I didn't matter, you know, play, uh, working in Topshop, you know, because I had, I had the music. But at some point, somehow we didn't quite make it enough to live of it. So... At some point, the band ran out of steam and I ran out of money because I still had sa all these times, you know, all, all these five, six years, I still had savings from, from these six months of, of investment banking. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, obviously I was very, very diligently, I was really afraid of kind of tucking into it, but it was always a little reserve in the back and it was kind of eaten away very, very slowly. Like, you know, maybe a few hundred pounds each month, but at some point after five years, it was gone. So I was like, okay, what am I going to do now? A, I need money, okay. So I tried myself at another couple of full-time jobs. Didn't last very long. <laughs> and uh, musically, I was like, okay, band is no more. What am I going to do? I'm by myself. Okay, well, DJ, great. I'm going to be a DJ. And this is when Annie O was born. At the same time, I started spending more and more time in Berlin. So I did for two, three years, I did the Berlin, London, maybe like half, half. And Berlin was a whole new playground. I, <laughs> I went out, partied, I met lots of people, I met lots of contacts and also got my first DJ gigs. And that's great, but that was a really also, I want to say, that was a difficult time because it wasn't all roses because at that time, as I said, I had no savings left and I really, really f struggled financially. I had to do lots and lots of jobs on the side. I struggled financially and sometimes didn't know how to pay my rent. I got into debt and it was really, it was really, really challenging. However, somehow I, you know, I stayed with it. I went through and got more and more gigs. And at some point, about two years ago, there came a turning point where I suddenly started making enough money of DJing so that I could just not have to do any other job. And saying yeah so I arrived somewhere <laughs> so and I couldn't believe it at first because all these years you know they were music was my focus but I had learned that it was always a struggle you know it was always just on the side or I had to do other things and suddenly I couldn't believe it that I get actually paid for something that doesn't feel like work it actually feels like a privilege and someone actually chooses to pay you for it. I just, <laughs> it was, imagine going to your favorite club and all your friends are there and you have fun and you party and you play your own music and you get paid for it. I mean, that's, how is that possible? <laughs> um, and the most wonderful thing about it is that I have now reached a point of total congruence. You know, I, I, I was saying about this conflict which I had between the two personas, but now, Basically, I, you know, everything I do, may it be professionally as a DJ or privately, 
you know, going out, meeting people, actually, it, there's no difference anymore between professionally and privately. So whatever I do, going out, meeting people, you know, partying, DJing, doing modeling jobs, writing an article for a newspaper, whatever. Whatever I do, it all feeds back into each other, and it's one and the same person. It's all, it's all Annie O, and that is hugely, hugely liberating. Whew. So, I mean, it would be consistent to take my trousers off now, but I'm not going to do that. So, <laughs> but I'm going to put these on. Oh, that feels good. So now I'm in my element again. Okay, so the big question is why didn't I, so remember that was the end of school, so why didn't I go straight to here? Why did I have to do all this detour? That is a very good question, <laughs> because that is, you know, I, I really had to reflect on that myself, because as I said, this, these 10 years were pretty much a very un, unconscious way. I didn't plan this. So basically my explanation is this. Um, I now know, now that I'm in tune with my internal compass, I know that I have certain needs and certain personality traits, which kind of is the same thing. So I have certain needs that are very, very crucial to my well-being. And I know now that when I look back on my 10 years, I realize now that they have been acting as unconscious driving forces. Let's say like the motor to my boat without sail. <laughs> so basically these were the things that were driving me all along and I can identify them now. And I want to tell you what it is. So A, autonomy and self-determination. I personally, as a person, I need total freedom. I need a high degree of freedom. I need to be independent and I need to be in control of my life. And I know that now because I tried myself at four full-time jobs, that one being the first one, and I never lasted more than seven months in any of them because for some reason, whatever it is, but being in a full-time role just suffocates me so much that every time my boat has been pulling me away from it again. Number two, variety and adventure. So, today I travel a lot and no week is the same. So I want to give you an example week of my working week. <laughs> so for example, on a Thursday night, I might DJ at a corporate event. So let's say the annual conference of an American pharmaceutical company at the Hilton Hotel in Berlin. <laughs> and then on a Friday, I might play at my residency at Kit Kat Club, and, um, which is a well-known naughty club. And I might, <laughs> I might play at a, um, so I play that at a gay fetish night. So I'm playing to a thousand muscular, hot, gay guys in leather gear. <laughs> and, then, and then the next, on, on a Saturday, I might fly to Copenhagen and DJ at a 1920s Gatsby-style swing ball. So what a wonderful variety. And I think you can imagine that this bad boy didn't quite tick that box. <laughs> and number three, individuality and self-expression. So. I think that even though I was brought up with quite a strong respect for authority and, and rules, I think there was always a tiny little rebel in me. I remember being sent home from investment banking training because I didn't adhere to the dress code. Um, but today, I can wear, I can say, I can do whatever the hell I want. And actually, it's nearly the other way around. The crazier, the better for my image. So. Today I get my validation not from money or status, but today I get my validation from, from ecstasy. Creating ecstasy for other people. <laughs> creating ecstasy on the dance floor. <clears throat> Feeling ecstasy myself when creating ecstasy on the dance floor. It's a two-way thing. Um, and from being recognized as a DJ and basically just from being myself in all my forms. And it's, again, it's just a wonderful thing. So now I'm all the wiser. Now I know these things and I know how they have shaped my journey. But for some reason I wasn't able, you know, when I was 18 coming out of school, I wasn't able to see these things or know that these were actually my needs. And I think probably because of my upbringing, because of environmental factors. So two things had to happen for me, like as a wake-up call. Um, number one is literally I had to get into a situation with no way out. I had to hit the wall because as a student, you still have a certain degree of freedom. So you can still, you know, you, no one tells you to go to the lecture. I mean, you know you should, but, you know, you still have freedom. 
But suddenly I was here, and even the even the the, the internship was, you know, three months. You know, I was like. Yeah, three months, great, you know? It, it, it wasn't serious yet, it wasn't serious. And suddenly, there it was, it was dead serious. That was like my job now. And so I was in a situation where I was so far removed from my actual spirit and with no way out, with no possibility of compensating for my needs that, that you know, my internal alarm grew so loud and my need to escape got so strong that I had no other way but to liberate myself from that golden prison that I had built for myself. Number two, London. Being in London was a major role because being exposed to all that exciting, crazy, colorful life, you know, it, and it seems that somehow it triggered or it wakened up things in me that must have already been there. They must have been dormant because London pulled it out of me and like tr transformed me at such tremendous speed. Because if I, let's say, if I had moved to Frankfurt and be <laughs> an investment banker, I mean, Frankfurt is not exactly known for its uh, alternative, exciting scene. So, um, <laughs> if I lived in Frankfurt and be a banker, and let's say lived by myself and hang out only with other bankers, I think it would have taken a lot, lot longer, if at all. I mean, it would have been very different anyways, but it would have taken a lot, lot longer for me to find my path. Even though I think actually already the decision to go to London for an internship was somehow, I think, already an, an unconscious pull away from what I knew and towards something new, towards a new environment. So it was that, that hit the wall situation plus new environmental factors that, that kind of came together and just created that explosion of six months <laughs> investment banking. Um, right, so to summarize, I couldn't have known before this was just as much a surprise to me than as to everyone else. I mean, to my parents and my bosses even. They, they you know, after <laughs> I was the only person out of the year of 200 people who, who um, yeah, who resigned after, in the first year, so. <laughs> um, and also, and that's also um, interesting, I don't think it was courage. It was, you know, I felt so badly caged in that, it was it was it was a necessary, required, maybe even somewhat predetermined correction of my course. And now the last question: I mean, do I regret? Uh, do I regret all this? Of course I don't, because it's it's part of who I am. It's part of the story. I would not be here if I wasn't if I hadn't been there. And also being a former or sometimes you know recovered investment banker, um, has opened a few doors in my life and people look at you differently when they find out about that story. So, um, you know, I'm glad, I, I'm glad I ticked that box. And, I mean, is there still a bit of investment banker in me? Well, have a look at my DJ software. <laughs> if that doesn't look like an Excel sheet, then I don't know. <laughs> Thank you, that was... <laughs> mm -hmm.